how on earth do I cover all this in 20 minutes? Well, what I'm going to do is just touch on a number of the fundamental, the key parts of company law and give you some of the a bullet points, some of the main issues uh, for you to take away and to understand so that you've got that background as you go forward with your business. Um, why company law? Well, Charlotte's explained the importance of protecting your IP, how the law can do that for you. But in terms of actually exploiting it and developing it, and to develop a product, you need money. To get the money, the money has to go somewhere. You need a person that can actually own the IP and attract the money you need. And that, unfortunately, is not you. It has to be a company. Investors are only going to give money to a company. Why is that? Well, there are a number of characteristics of a company that make it really important from an investment point of view. The first is that the company has what we call separate legal personality. It is actually legally a person. It can own property like you and me. It can sue and be sued. It can enter into contracts. So it has its own legal rights and responsibilities. If you or I were going to start trading in our own name or in partnership with others, we would have unlimited liability for the debts that we incurred. If we were sued, we would be liable for whatever the court decided uh, we owed. A company confers limited liability on its owners, on the investors. That's why it has to have the word limited in its name. So a member or shareholder is usually only liable to the extent of the money that they've actually invested in the company. And when you make the investment, the company issues you with shares. The shares are your ownership interest. You can then buy and sell the shares. So over time, ownership of the company can change. And linked to that is the concept that a company has perpetual succession. So in other words, the owners can die. The owners, if they're other companies, can go bust. But the company continues. And then the last and, and, and another very important uh, matter that you need to understand is that there is separation between the ownership and management of a company. The owners of a company do not need to take any part in its management. The management is delegated to the board of directors. They're responsible for managing the company. So you and I can own BP, M&S, Next, RBS. We can own all these companies, but we have no involvement in running them. And this is why the shareholders are allowed to have limited liability, because they're not responsible for running the company. They've delegated that responsibility to the, to the directors. The directors, as long as they behave properly, will have limited liability as well. But there are more situations where they can be attacked if they do things that are wrong. Um, and I'll come on to those in a little while. So because of this structure, this wonderful idea of a company, we've been able to build transcontinental railways. We've been able to build jet engines. We've even <coughs> been able to develop speculative therapeutic products. And it's all because we've had the confidence that we can put money into this entity and allow it to develop it without further recourse to us. And that works very well for all the investors that are looking <coughs> to back your ideas. So just one further point. Every company has a set of rules. Some of them are set out in the Companies Act. But a lot of them are set out in what are called the Articles of Association, and that's the constitutional document of the company. So it will explain how board meetings take place, how the directors run the company. It will explain how the shareholders meet and vote and de deal with things to do with them. And most importantly, the articles are where you will find the rights that attach to the different classes of shares in the company. So how are you going to set one up? Well. As you've all read the Oswang blogs, you'll know how to set them up. So this is a short piece of the uh, presentation. Um, really, the easiest and simplest uh, and quickest way to do it is to do it yourself via the Companies House website. Companies House is the, registry, the registrar of companies in the UK. So you go online uh, and you go into setting up a company, and they can do it in about 24 hours at a cost of about £15. Pounds. You can go to a registration agent or a law firm and get them to do it for hundreds of pounds. So it's up to you. I obviously favor the latter, but I can see why you might not. 
To go onto the website and do this, it's not very difficult. You simply need to give the information that I've set out on the slide, who the shareholders or subscribers are going to be, directors, name, and the name can't be confused with the name of an existing company, but you can check on the website whether that name's already in use. You need to say what the initial share capital will be, and you usually will adopt the, article, the model form of articles that's recommended on the company's house website. That's absolutely fine. They do the job on day one. You don't need to have more than one shareholder, one director, and one share just to get the thing up and running. And you can then appoint new directors, introduce new shareholders, and issue new shares subsequently. If you have only one director, it has to be a human being. You can have companies as directors, so it is a serious point, but it does now have to be. It didn't used to be, but it now does have to be a real live human being, which is great. So. The shareholders, well, as I've said, the shareholders own the company. But equally, it's important to realize that the company is a separate entity from the shareholders. So because it's a separate legal person, the shareholders don't own the company's assets. They just own the shares in the company. And this is important because if you are going to assign valuable IP, your clever ideas, into the company, once you've done that, they're the companies, they're not yours anymore. So if you haven't set the structure up properly with the people that you're going into business with, or if you fall out with them, you can't turn around in three months' time and say, I've changed my mind, I want to take my IP back, I want to take back all the stuff that I put in here. Sorry, that point has gone. You will have the shares that you've been given for putting the IP in or whatever else you've decided to reward yourselves. But essentially, those are, that IP, those assets are no longer yours. So that's why it's important that you get these things sorted out properly on day one, because you, you can't turn back afterwards. Now, you can become a shareholder in one of two ways. The first way that I've been talking about really so far is that you subscribe for shares. And that's basically when the company issues brand new shares to you. No one's ever owned them before. Brand new shares. That's called subscribing for shares. And you pay the company for the shares. The other way is that you can purchase shares, obviously, from an existing shareholder, as I've said before. And in those circumstances, you pay the money to the other shareholder, they transfer the shares to you, and you then re-register with the company, and you become the owner of the shares. So it's important, both on subscription and, and on a transfer, that you get your name registered, because the definitive determining factor as to who a member is, who a shareholder is, it's what's written into the company's register of members. Until then, you don't have rights. You can't exercise any of the voting rights, rights to receive dividends, etc. So again, with early stage companies, quite often these things get overlooked. They're sort of not really considered important. They are important. Get the details sorted out quickly and get your company sorted and in, because investors are going to look at things like that when they come to invest. And if it's all a bit of a shambles, they're going to be a little bit put off. They're not going to think you're necessarily as serious as you really are. How do shareholders make decisions? They do delegate most of the business, the management of the company to the board, but they do retain rights in respect of big things, ownership things, and they make decisions by way of resolution. Um, resolutions are either by majority or a supermajority, which is usually set at 75%. Uh, it is in the Companies Act, but you can vary that in some circumstances. You can pass a resolution in one of two ways. One is in a meeting, which is we call a general meeting, and the other is for private companies by way of a written resolution where everybody signs it and confirms that they agree to it. And that's much more common, really, in private companies because it's easier to administer. If you're holding a general meeting, you either pass it on a show of hands, in which case you've one vote each, or what we call by way of a poll. And in that case, you count up the number of votes that each person, a number of shares rather, that each person has. They get one vote per share. So there's quite a difference potentially in the way that you would pass resolutions, depending on whether you have a show of hands or a poll. I've listed some of the common shareholder rights here that you would expect to see in a private company. Preemption means that the existing shareholders have first call if the company wants to issue new shares. It can't just go and issue them to someone outside the company. It has to offer them first to the existing shareholders. Likewise, if you want to sell, the other existing shareholders have a first right to say, I'll buy those in, thanks very much, before they lose control to a third party. 
Dividend rights are simply when the company makes a profit, you distribute it to the shareholders by way of dividend. Um, sometimes shareholders or classes of shares will have particular rights to appoint directors. And a right of redemption is a share that is a share that is redeemable is issued on the basis that it can be sold back to the company, usually in accordance with terms that are set out in the Articles of Association. So shareholders' agreements. Um, usually contain additional protections and investors will require you to enter into one but before you even get to the point of having investors once you've set your company up and there's a group of you you will almost certainly want to have a shareholders agreement of your own and we will call this a founders agreement but it's essentially just a shareholders agreement by another name it's just one particular subcategory of shareholders agreement so when you set your company up here are some of the things that you should be thinking about addressing in the shareholders or founders agreement <coughs> First of all, who has responsibility among you for what? And how together are you going to make decisions? Who in particular has line management responsibilities for particular things? In the early stages of a company, you're juggling lots of different things. You're doing lots of different roles. You're trying to get the company up and running. It's actually really important for you to sit down and say, OK, you're going to be responsible for this. I'm going to be responsible for that. Because otherwise, these things will fall through the cracks. And you will find that you've made a mistake. You've left something out. And you need to rewind. And it can cost you months of valuable time in the process of raising money with investors. So organizing, sitting down, and working that out, and working out who's responsible for what is a really valuable thing to do early on. You also need to work out how you're going to make decisions. The board is responsible for decision making. But amongst yourselves, in a company at this stage, because it's so close, you shouldn't get too hung up on the formalities of, of those decisions. You should be talking regularly, and you should be deciding, are you going to do it such that the big decisions require you all to agree? Or are you happy that a majority of you can drive things forward? I would recommend a majority, because the important thing, frankly, at this stage is to drive forward. You need to keep momentum behind an early stage company, or else it's very likely just to fizzle out. So you need to think about these issues and how far you need to enshrine them in a founder's agreement. The other issue is who owns what and how soon do they own it. You may be sitting there thinking, OK, we're going to split this company equally. We're four of us, three of us, whatever it is. That's the fair thing to do. It may not be the fair thing to do. First of all, one or two of you may have done a great deal of work preparing the intellectual property that the company rests on. Those people maybe should get a bigger share of the initial pie. Equally, some of you may be putting in a great deal more time and energy to driving the company forward, others not. That needs to be reflected as well. So I would recommend that you sit down and have a very open conversation at the outset about who is going to get what, and not just assume that it's going to be equal, because if you don't address it, it can eat away at people over time. And you don't want to start in six or 12 months' time falling out with each other. The other issue linked to this is vesting. Basically what this means is, are you going to get shares based on what you've already done? Or are you going to get shares based on what you're going to do in the future for the company? Or maybe a bit of both. Vesting addresses this because if you're going to do your work in the future, if you get all your shares up front and then walk away, you've got something for nothing. So what you can do is say, OK, we agree that we're only going to get so many shares at this stage, and it can be different for different people because, as I've said, some may have done added a lot of value early, some may be about to add a lot of value in the next 12 months. And you can say that you will vest over a period of time, either time-based or based on particular performance criteria. So you can issue the shares, and it's important for tax reasons that you do issue the shares on day one, and then say that they actually become valuable in time. So if you walk out halfway through, half your shares will convert into meaningless, valueless shares. And you'll keep those that you've, uh, you've actually created value for, but you will lose the ones that you haven't. So that's another issue you need to think about as founders. IP, just briefly touching on this and coming back to what Charlotte was covering earlier, but from a legal point of view in the founders agreement, everyone connected with the company who has created value in the IP has to assign those rights to the company. Otherwise, you will end up with gaps 
and risk the IP, the company not being a viable proposition. This is really important to investors. I can't stress how important it is to investors. You have got to capture IP. So in the founder's agreement, the founder should all assign all the IP into the company. And then in the future, everyone else who, has, who works on the company who may create IP should also enter into an assignment with the company. I've been involved in investments where you get to within a week of the investment being made, quite often because the company isn't going to have much more than a week because it's run out of money, and you find that someone's IP wasn't properly assigned. And the furthest away they've got, I think, was China. And this was probably about 10 years ago, so imagine trying to get hold of someone in China 10 years ago to get an assignment of IP. It can be, re it can be really life-threatening to companies, so that's one I really want you to remember. And then the last piece of that pie I would refer to is confidentiality and non-competition. You want to ensure that everybody is bound by a confidentiality obligation so that they can't go and use the information that they found out in connection with the company somewhere else or for someone else's benefit. And a non-competition obligation as well means that they can't just walk out of the company and set up in competition the next day with another company. It gives you a window of maybe a year, six months, when you can continue to drive the company forward and they can't compete with you. Now, as I said, shareholders' agreements have a, have a wider meaning. Investors, institutional investors, will all require you to enter into a shareholders' agreement. When they do, your founders' agreement goes in the bin. Bits of it will survive and be adopted and brought into the new agreement, but there will be a lot of new rights come in because the investors will want to have control over the way that their money is managed in the company. I'm not going to go into that now because that's a huge topic all on its own. And as I say, they all look the same in the sense that you can't really negotiate a great deal of it. There are areas, that, and therefore they are quite sort of standard form in the way that they're delivered by investors. All investors will work within quite narrow parameters. Um, so you will have to, to live with what you're served on that. Directors. So another early decision you have to make is who are the directors going to be. Most likely, your starting point is going to be that you, the founders, will all be directors on day one and that you'll be involved in that capacity in the company. Over time, though, the company will evolve and it will need to bring in new people, people with different skill sets. Um, and at that point, some of you will probably be asked to step down from the board. Don't feel offended. Well, feel offended if you want to, but tough. It's normal. It's what happens. OK, so you will find that this happens. And when investors come in, they will usually want to appoint someone to represent their interests on the board, to monitor their investment, but also to add value that they can bring to the company. So you'll see that change over time. So the directors manage the company. The board of directors collectively manage the company. The board can then delegate to individuals, maybe individual directors or not directors. Uh, it can delegate particular tasks to committees, but it must always continue to monitor what those delegates do. So you can't just wash your hands and say, oh, yeah, well, I'm not, not responsible for that anymore. You've got to continue to be in charge of the company. Um, how often should the board meet? Well, that depends. It depends on the stage the company's at. Uh, it depends on a lot of factors. But once you start to get uh, the company moving forward, it's good to have regular meetings. Once investors come on board, they will usually expect you to meet as a board at least six and probably nine or ten times maximum a year for formal meetings. And there will, of course, be a load of interaction in between informal email calls, conversations, and so on. But that's the sort of structure that you can expect. Now, as directors, you owe duties to the company and its shareholders collectively. And I've put these up uh, on the on the slide. I'm not. I've done 40 minutes an hour on these in the past. I could go on forever about it. And if you're not careful, I will. Um, the big one is you've got to promote the success of the company, but that's kind of obvious. You have to exercise independent judgment, which means you can't do what other people tell you. You have to make your own mind up as a director. That's really important. And you have to use reasonable skill, care, and diligence. And by that, you're judged on a fairly sort of what we call man on the Clapham omnibus basis. That's the old test that some judge in, when buses were called omnibuses uh, elucidated. 
You also have obligations to declare interest in transactions and avoid conflicts of interest. It's probably not a big issue at this stage, but it's one you need to bear in mind. If you're in a situation where you have an interest in something else, you need to tell the board if they have to make a decision on, on a matter related to that. So it may be that you have an interest because you're still employed in the university, for example. Um, and you need to let them know that so that they can make an informed decision. You can maybe be party to the decision or you may be asked to leave the room, but the, di the directors have to make informed decisions. Uh, and then finally there, there are a number of transactions because directors are in this position of running a company and basically managing other people's money, um, there are some things that they get involved with the company that require you to go back up to the members and say, hey, I've just given myself a 10-year contract. You don't mind, do you? Uh, yeah, we do mind, actually. We need to pass a resolution to approve that. Or I've decided to leave and I'm going to give myself all this money in this deal. Uh, no, not quite. Uh, not until I say so. So those things, again... They're unusual transactions, but you just need to be aware that at some things you go back up to the shareholders. Now, I'm not going to dwell on financial reporting because it's really boring, and if you thought that was bad, this could be terminal for most of you. Um, <laughs> but again, coming back to this idea of separation between management and ownership, and also because companies owe money to other people, they have creditors. Creditors and owners need to have some way of knowing what the board's doing with their money. So for that reason, company law requires companies to produce annual accounts. And they do that by reference to what's called the annual, the, the accounting reference date, which is the same each year. You can move it for, for particular reasons, but essentially the idea is that people are able to compare year on year how a company's doing. And for all but the smallest companies, those accounts have to be audited by independent auditors, which effectively gives the creditors and the members, um, the reassurance that they've been properly prepared. And the phrase that's used in the Companies Act, and that's the fundamental cornerstone of companies' accounts, is that they give a true and fair view of assets, liabilities, profits, financial position of the company during that financial year. And then those are overlaid, that, that test is overlaid with a vast amount of accounting rules and procedures which the auditors check through to make sure that they've been uh, complied with. Now, the amount of paperwork that this leads to in the case of public companies runs to hundreds of pages. In the case of your companies, it probably runs to maybe 10 pages. So as you get bigger and more sophisticated, so do the accounts. But they are fairly light touch for an early stage company. The only other important financial reporting point that I want to touch on is that a company has an obligation to keep adequate accounting records. Adequate isn't defined, so it really depends on the circumstances and, of course, on the size and financial complexity of your company, and it will therefore change over time. So you really need, from the start, to record, at least on a monthly basis, all the transactions that have been going on through the company so that you've got those records available come the end of the year to do the accounts quickly, the annual accounts quickly. Share capital. Um, it's been mentioned earlier, but when you set your company up, you will usually issue ordinary shares. They all have the same rights. As the company grows, it'll issue new shares with different rights, and those shares normally have different names. So we start talking about A, B, C, D, etc. So that's why you'll see that in articles of association. Um, In the context of investors' rights, um, one thing that's worth <coughs> noting is that I've talked before, you may have heard me talk before, about the sort of the jargon that goes into venture capital investment. Um, and people talk about participating preferred shares and ratchets and cumulative dividends and good and bad lever. If you get a term sheet from an investor, you need to know what that actually means in terms of how it's going to take value away from you. So you should seek advice <coughs> before you sign a term sheet. Sometimes you see companies turn up with a signed term sheet and you think, oh my God, we're really going to have to work hard to row back from some of this. So early advice, really important. Don't give away value cheaply. 
One small technical thing is that shares cannot be issued for less than their nominal value. Every share has to have a nominal value, a face value. It could be a pound, penny, it could even be a hundredth of a penny, but there just has to be a nominal value. If you have shares worth a pound and you issue them and pay, and say you're issuing them for a penny, that person still has to pay 99p, even if you've agreed that they're only going to pay 1p. And that comes in if the company goes bust. A liquidator will turn around and say, pay up, guys. So never issue shares for less than their nominal value. Share options. In the UK, and I expect elsewhere, but I practice in England, so I'm afraid it's all I can talk to. Um, it's possible, not always, but usually possible for founders to receive shares when they set the company up. For tax reasons, it may not be, and you may need to issue share options instead. Likewise, once the company is set up and it holds valuable rights, the IP that you've assigned to it, at that point it probably doesn't make sense to issue shares because there's a tax liability, almost certainly a tax liability when you do. So we use share options instead. So what are share options? Well, basically a share option is the right to receive a share. So the company will say, I'll give you an option over 100 shares. That means you have the right to say, yep, I'll have those shares. Now, clearly, you don't want those shares until you have an opportunity to pay the tax. So therefore, they're usually linked to an exit, a sale, or an IPO. And at that point, you exercise your option. And the nice thing about options is that I issue you at today's price, and in 10 years' time, you exercise the option. And the price, the value of the share, has hopefully gone up to here somewhere, so you make a big profit on the difference. That's how options work. Um, there are special sorts of options. Um, enterprise management incentive schemes or EMI schemes are particularly, uh, particularly designed for companies like yours. And if you combine them with other reliefs, you can reduce the tax on your profit to as little as 10%, which really is about as good as it gets. Uh, there's a whole industry around options, lawyers, accountants, and specialists. So you shouldn't be thinking to set up share options and option schemes yourself without taking some advice, because if you get it wrong, you can lose a lot of value as a result. It's important to spend a little bit of money getting this right. And so to the end, now I'm sure all your companies are going to be hugely successful and make you a lot of money, but some poor people out there are going to set up companies that don't succeed. <coughs> And being a director of a failing company is a very dangerous thing because you can expose yourself to personal liability for the debts of the company if you don't behave properly. And this is all covered in the Insolvency Act. It's particularly dangerous, and I think Newman might have mentioned this, around the point of time when you're looking to do another fundraising because usually you're running out of money at that point. You're running on fumes, as they say. And if someone, if one of the investors turns and just says, right, I'm out of here, you can be dead. So what you have to do is be very careful in that period when you're running out of money, when you're short of money, to ensure that you are monitoring the situation as a board of directors, that you are taking appropriate advice from professionals at that time, and that you're not overstretching the company's credit. So I've put up here what insolvency is. Uh, basically a description of it as it is under the Insolvency Act. If you're unable to pay your debts as they fall due and have no reasonable prospect of raising finance to do so, then you're insolvent. And that means you need to stop trading. There are two reasons. One is to preserve the assets for the benefit of the existing creditors so as much as possible can be given to them. Uh, and also to stop creating new creditors. And if you don't do that, then the risk is that you as a director will be hauled up for wrongful trading or even worse, fraudulent trading. And if that happens, you have a risk of personal liability. Now, as long as you're doing the things that I just mentioned and you're being responsible, the likelihood of that is very remote. But it is the sort of sword of Damocles that hangs over you at, around, at, at this sort of time. And in addition, you can be disqualified for up to 15 years, but that's really for be very, very bad behavior. Uh, and it's very unusual for it to happen. So that was all I wanted to say. I don't know whether it was 20 minutes or 25 minutes, but it was about 20 minutes in my view.